The American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities is pleased to host today's webinar. For those of you attending your first ASEF webinar, ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the U.S. Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. If it is not your first time to join an ASEF webinar, welcome back. Please know that ASEF is here to support you beyond today's webinar, and we invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org or join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have a wonderful presenter, Mr. Sean O'Donnell, joining us today for this webinar entitled, Imagining the Future Through Existing Buildings. Sean O'Donnell has over 15 years of experience as an architect focused on learning environments design. Mr. O'Donnell's work is informed by his research into how environments successfully accommodate diverse and changing user needs over time. This approach has helped him establish a national reputation as a leader in educational facility planning and design. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the Clearinghouse for inviting me in today to discuss imagining the school of the future through existing buildings. Today what I'd like to do is share with you some of the challenges presented against uh, the continuing success of our existing building inventory in the 21st century and learning environment and also then share with you five case studies from our portfolio that illustrate buildings that have risen to those challenge and uh, successfully created a great learning environment for the children you know currently studying within them and also uh, going forward into the future. You should know this is a complement to two other resources provided by the Clearinghouse, uh, a podcast by Roy Yader and an interactive web resource by uh, Renee Coleman. It also complements an article that I wrote in Learning by Design in 2010. This conversation that we're going to have today started about 20 years ago when I was a young architect just graduating from my master's program and I attended a program at Teachers College up at Columbia University in New York and one of the faculty uh, from Teachers College had started to suggest that our existing building inventory just wasn't adequate to address 21st century education that in fact we had to replace all of our existing infrastructure really to adequately address education and, and new pedagogies and new technologies that were emerging uh, as key components of 21st century education. As a young architect, being very impressionable, uh, talking to this authority figure, I, I tended to believe him and tended to agree with him. And this belief uh, was shared by many, uh, many in the room at the time, but it also underpins much of the literature, the conversation, and the policy that was in place in that day and also in many ways continues uh, to this day. So um, I spent the subsequent 20 years, though, learning that what he was expressing in many ways was an opinion. It wasn't fact, and in the ensuing 20 years, uh, many, many buildings were demolished uh, you know, in response to that opinion and uh, belief that our existing infrastructure can't support contemporary educational needs. Um, you see a few photographs here of buildings in Ohio that were demolished, uh, and looking at some of the data, the, it reports that in 2010, uh, 90 uh, existing school buildings were demolished in 2010 in Ohio. So you can imagine over 20 years, over 50 states, you know, that uh, we're losing an a incredible set of assets and resources that could continue to successfully educate our children. And one of the quotes that I like the most about this conversation that we're having is one from Vincent Scully, who is a renowned uh, architectural historian from Yale University. And he stated at one point that architecture is a conversation between generations carried out across time. And if you consider you know, some of the imagery that you see here, these very notable civic buildings, you, you might start to wonder whether or not we've cut that conversation short. 
at least with respect to some of these buildings, and that we need to step back and perhaps reevaluate uh, how we accept assess the continued performance of these buildings uh, within our portfolios. I'm not alone certainly in thinking that. Um, also from Ohio, here's a quote from uh, a publication online discussing you know, a tension, a value proposition as it were, you know, between two parties that were in conflict with how they evaluated uh, the assets that they have in their communities. One proposal to replace and centralize many facilities and then um, Another contingent, you know, arguing that these are great community assets, that they have broad social and community uh, impacts, you know, and uh, effects and value, in fact, maybe in contrast to the value proposition being considered by the other side. So what I'd like to do today is, is consider really how we assess the, the value of some of our existing buildings relative to their future performance. There are many challenges to our existing infrastructure in our existing buildings. I've listed just a few here. I'm going to try and touch on many of them as we go, but it wouldn't be possible nearly to dig deeply into any one of them, but I'll again sort of skim across each of the topics and then perhaps in the Q&A we can dig deeper into some of them. But first, the idea of a 60% rule or two-thirds rule is, is a major policy component within many state jurisdictions. Um, it's been studied and written about by uh, a number of people, including one study in Michigan, for example, that went back and challenged this idea that if a modernization project costs two-thirds of a new building, then we should opt for the more expensive new construction. Reinforcing that idea, Michigan found that in almost every instance, if not all of them, that uh, renovation projects were coming in less expensive than the new construction. So when you think of this in sort of a, a superficial way, it's, it's a very hard proposition to consider. Uh, hard to explain to your children that uh, if you have one option that's less expensive than the more expensive option, you should go for the more expensive option. But really, this, this two-thirds rule or 60% rule in many ways is, I think, the key to the conversation that we're having because it's, it's really about value, again, and it's about how we value the ability of our existing buildings to perform as, as well as our new buildings are. In many ways, again, there, there appears to be a bias that the new architecture always outperforms the, uh, the modernized or renovated uh, architecture that we could possibly achieve. And as one illustration of how you can start to see that sort of bias uh, in the literature, here's a, a table from a publication called The Preventative Maintenance of Buildings, which was really arguing that we ought to uh, do a better job of maintaining our buildings. But it starts to suggest that as you don't do preventative maintenance, that the rate of deterioration starts to accelerate and goes through a state of failures, some minor failures, major failures, and then you know, finally into a, a building that's not reusable. But I think the where you start to see the the interesting question and the question that you'll you'll see addressed by the case studies, I hope, is whether or not the buildings can ever get back to this this state of being like new down here at the bottom. So you see that their graph, once you cross that normal wear line, never returns back down to that state of being like new. And what I'd like to do today is, is uh, suggest that perhaps that's not true and there's opportunities to bring a lot of these existing buildings back to a state of like new and in some instances a state that's uh, even better than uh, the new facilities. Another issue that is often raised, of course, is the uh, lack of programmatic fit between the existing facilities and you know, the way we're presenting our education today and the pedagogy that we're using, the technology that we're using. Snyder in 2004 surveyed principals in New Jersey and started to find you know, things that we would think, you know, that we would expect in many ways, that uh, lack of science facilities, you know, other specials like music and art, special education, preschool, after school activities, all you know, a misfit between the existing facilities and the program that teacher planning and other collaborative efforts among the faculty you know, weren't supported. Finally, that study concluded that 
the buildings and the, the districts that had older infrastructure, you know, quite logically had a, a greater uh, deficit that they're addressing. Earthman also in 2004 um, came up with a similar conclusion that uh, when you started to look at student achievement and building age, there was a correlation. Um, in many ways, uh, it was because, as he states, that they didn't have the necessary elements to support student learning. So he found this direct correlation you know, between our architecture and student achievement. To think about that uh, in context, it's not just a, a single moment in time or a single instance that obsolesces our facilities programmatically. Tom Roger of uh, Gilbane authored this great study that I'm going to share with you in the next few slides about the sort of progressive evolution of of our curriculum, our pedagogy, of our policy uh, against the existing architecture. Here, starting with uh, a model, you know, hypothetically of a building created in 1925 and then modified in 1950, so uh, a building that would have a capacity in 1950 of 600 students. But then, as union contracts evolve, you know, the student population diminishes because of the uh, individual classroom population changes. Code and other statutory compliance issues come up. You start to see special ed coming in here and, and uh, other resources that also continues to challenge both the housing of that program, but then also you know, reducing the total capacity of the building. Additional program needs, teacher resource, science, library media center, specials like music coming in, again the student capacity dropping, the the use of space changing relatively dramatically and perhaps you know, demands on the infrastructure. And no child left behind, you know, having you know continued influence on the capacity of the building, changing the program. And now you can start to think about, you know, yet again we have the uh, common core rising, so yet perhaps another slide that's due in, in this analysis about how program and infrastructure and uh, architecture are coming together to create you know, this, this misalignment you know, that uh, is constantly raised when we're looking at buildings of any vintage at this point. There was a study in 1991 you know, which started to suggest that also, building conditions went hand in hand you know, with the age of uh, a school building. So the older they are, the worse condition they tend to be in, again, looking at deferred maintenance. But what that study also found uh, you know, seems quite logical as well, that um, if those deferred maintenance issues and infrastructure issues were addressed, student achievement would be improved um, you know, quite dramatically on the scale that they were using at the time. When we start to think about these pressures of change within our existing buildings, there are a number of models that I think are useful to, to consider you know, really how we ought to assess and maintain and invest in our systems. Uh, many of them are derived from workplace environments, um, both from uh, Francis Duffy and, uh, and Stuart Brand's then interpretation of some of Francis Duffy's models about how buildings change. Um, and you see uh, Stuart Brand's model here, and I'll just quickly go down the line. It's, it's really on the rate of change, with the top of the scale being the things that change most quickly. Stuff is furniture, books, you know, things that are loose that move you know, from moment to moment, day to day within a building. The space plan, you know, as we saw, that is challenged you know, periodically, uh, you know, perhaps annually or you know, throughout a span of five or ten years. Services having a life of you know, 20, 30, maybe 50 years, and then things ranging from the envelope of the building, which is much more long-lived typically, to the structure which and the site, which tend to be things that are you know, the most long-lasting, if not permanent. Um, the development community has is, is worked with this kind of pace of change continuously. As you can see in the image on the lower left, uh, this is a warehouse in Chicago that was torn down to the structure and then is being uh, adaptively reused. But you can see it in our schools as well in the upper photograph here where you start to see this this layering of systems you know coming into a building that was in 1926 you know so that this kind of progressive tearing a part of the existing building is occurring quite literally in, in many of our schools you know that have these very similar conditions very evidently manifest but the point being here, though, that 
is if we think on these different scales that Brand has proposed here, perhaps we attack the problem at each one of those and we don't treat the building as a singular object that uh, obsolesces all at one point. For example, when we look at Earthman's assessment on what's important in student achievement, um, and he did this, uh, I, I believe, for the Maryland public schools when they're considering reinvesting uh, in their existing facilities and where they would get the most impact for their investment. Um, and you can see that the top four you know, fall into that services category, human comfort, indoor air quality, lighting, acoustical control. And the bottom three then start to fall Tom Roger's analysis of you know, the obsolescence of the space plan. And these were several of the issues that were raised by the principals in New Jersey as well. So if we can focus on the upper end of that scale, perhaps we can salvage and retain many of the things that fall to the bottom of the scale, skin, structure, site, uh, and retain the value of, of our existing infrastructure. Of course, one of the most important ways that we can assess the future performance of our facilities is this idea of educational adequacy. And you see one definition um, up on top, the degree to which school facilities can support the instructional mission and methods. And all through capacity, technology, supervision, security, instructional ages, uh, all the way down to uh, adjacencies and relationships of space. The important thing to note, though, is that the tool that's most readily accessible to do this is typically an educational specification, which allows you to get into the, the varied pedagogies, um, you know, the varied curricula, um, and even diversity of pedagogies that can occur in one building, very specifically you know, addressing your specific needs in the evaluation, not using a, a sort of generic uh, template to evaluate your facilities. But the other is that um, almost any existing building is going to fail uh, in this analysis. Analysis. Even buildings that are, are built uh, just a few years ago will, will have some misfits because uh, change is ongoing and rapid and, and increasing and our infrastructure, you know, even as new it is as some of our buildings are, are already being challenged by that wave of change like the Common Core Standards. There are other attributes, certainly, of creating good learning environments that go hand in hand with that assessment. I'm not going to go through all of them here, but you know, everything from uh, light quality technology, views and display, furniture and space. Um, so again, that helps evaluate uh, the architecture and trying to also establish uh, principles for how we hope that our architecture goes forward into the future. A few more challenges um, outside of the building that I'd like to, to share before jumping into the case studies as well is that there were a series of guidelines that were put forth by CEFPI uh, many years ago, um, and they've subsequently backed away from them just to be clear, but they still permeate many of the policies that states have in place, and they also uh, quite often are raised in, in the discussion about the uh, future of particular school sites, whether or not um, a site should be abandoned and uh, a school relocated to a, a larger, perhaps more remote location. And these standards are challenging in this day and age. If the case studies that I'm going to share with you, only one of them would comply. And then you see on the right a study that was done back in 2002 of school sites in South Carolina where these standards were, were vastly exceeded. Um, and having des uh, sat on a number of design juries uh, through my career, I've seen sites you know, that range you know, all the way up to 100 acres uh, for uh, high school sites, you know, so vastly larger than uh, th what the standard would call for. But again, a proposition that in many ways is quite challenging for uh, many of uh, our clients certainly to find sites of that scale. But when we think of site selection too, there are a host of issues. You know, uh, that we won't be able to go into in any depth today either. But you know, we hear so much about obesity and, and wellness um, and uh, also declining operational budgets certainly since 2008 and the idea that traffic congestion is increasing certainly around many of our municipalities and uh, with that goes increasing traffic-related injury, also automotive-related uh, sustainable impacts to the environment or lack of sustainable impact, and 
uh, associated development costs with moving schools to other sites um, that often aren't accounted for in the bottom line for school budgets that are often borne by the development community. And then uh, this idea that land scarcity and sprawl uh, you know, continues to challenge the ability to comply with those large standards and, and requiring creativity on, on our sites in many ways that perhaps wasn't uh, necessary before. Just thinking through some of those issues as well, certainly since I was a child, the rate of uh, walking and biking to school has declined in part because we've started to abandon uh, some of those tighter sites and move to larger sites where uh, they're perhaps exurban or outside of neighborhoods and communities, so requiring people to drive through. Uh, the campus uh, having a, perhaps a negative health impact. Just a quick analysis that was published uh, a few years back about those older environments, those older neighborhoods, tighter knit fabrics where walking was, was much more possible because there's an infrastructure of sidewalks, the, the civic buildings like schools perhaps uh, more integrated into that in infrastructure that would allow biking and walking. And then thinking about the transportation costs associated with some of our sites. So when we start to evaluate our sites, we're really thinking comprehensively here about these impacts. And one of the things I've seen most frequently discussed in the budget cuts of the last few years is transportation. And uh, a Washington Post article a few years ago cited the statistic that uh, one bus equaled one teacher. So where we would uh, put our investment, you know, with, would be obvious in, in that kind of equation that you know if we can reduce the need for our transportation uh, outside of walking, biking, then we can focus our efforts on the educational environment. DPA has also done a number of studies too that should be considered when we're evaluating existing sites versus perhaps new sites and using the metric that you know, traffic goes up 30% during the school year then the associated uh, combustion and emissions uh, associated with that increase you know, between more integrated community schools or neighborhood schools as they propose here versus more remote sites uh, being dramatically different and, and in favor of the smaller scaled sites integrated into the community. Other issues too that as we're concerned with health, wellness, and safety of our children, the CDC reports that the Motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death of our U.S. teens. So if we're uh, incentivizing them to drive or even requiring them to drive to, to get to school, um, that may be working in, in contrast to some of our larger goals for the environment. When we think about tight sites, the sites that are smaller than those CEFPI goals, um, many districts have come up with very clever solutions. Here's a transportation demand management uh, resource and, and PR campaign that was launched by the Arlington Public Schools to foster people getting out of their cars and taking other modes of transport, including the public bus, uh, to the site. And finally, sort of a, you know, a, a flip way of looking at uh, scale here, too, when we think about uh, alternative sites. I mentioned that uh, you know, I've seen sites upwards of 100 acres for a high school. This is just an illustration of what 100 acres looks like in, in Old Town Alexandria. It's the preponderance of the historic district, uh, as you know, some of you may be aware. So just a scale comparison as, as to what you can do with those kinds of resources, uh, particularly in the land scarcity that we have. So to begin the case studies to discuss some of those challenges and show how some existing buildings have risen to the occasion to create 21st century educational environments, I wanted to start with a classification system that's you know, purely my own and based on my own uh, professional experience. But uh, you'll see that there are four columns here and they fall into four sort of generations of buildings. Um, the first here, you know, are essentially 19th century buildings um, that often you know, were neoclassical in their design and reference, you know, symmetrical buildings. They were buildings that have so, you know, perhaps a sort of tough sort of civic presence, you know, as, as we might call it, uh, integrated into the fabric of their community. Very simple plans that you can see down here, really just classrooms um, with some support space organized around you know, the egress system of the building. They were, again, as I noted, integrated quite often into a very walkable fabric because of you know, even the lack of choice of transport back then. 
the generation that followed it uh, really are the pre-World War II buildings, the buildings of the 20s and 30s, often aesthetically, you know, buildings that have great civic presence, as most people would consider, you know, the Georgian and the Gothic buildings. Uh, you know, they were symmetrical, typically. Uh, their programs had become a little bit more diverse, you know, including things like multi-purpose rooms here. But again, more most typically just a typical classroom organized around uh, a sort of small-scale double-loaded corridor. It's hard to see, but this is a high school of this generation on this site down here very tightly integrated into the fabric of its community. This happens to be in rural Virginia. The generation following that, calling post-war the buildings of the 50s and 60s, um, they're, you know, they're like a cup of coffee. You know, when you first started drinking coffee, you probably didn't like it, but you grew to appreciate it over time. Um, that's how I feel about these buildings. You know, they're not necessarily the most attractive buildings, but they have uh, you know, something going for them that they were predicated, as you can see on the plan, on natural light. They often had courtyards, they had large windows, um, increasing diversity in their programs. They're asymmetrical, you know, quite often because of both the modernist point of view and then the increasing diversity of their programs. But they also often challenged uh, conventional construction technology and, and where we'll see we've had instances of, of problems with low floor to floor heights and uh, you know exterior wall uh, construction detailing problems uh, they also uh, reflect the rise of the car this this site happens to be just a few miles from the one on the left but you see it's right off uh, essence and interstate highway the rise of the automobile allowed them to become much more far flung in, in their uh, sighting and, and their relationship to community and then finally the the building that I will touch upon are the ones that are you know, even more challenging than a cup of coffee, the energy crisis buildings. Quite often windowless, very large buildings. They challenged the existing pedagogy to create open plan structures. This is all open space within you know, just a half of the building that you see above, which is as big as an aircraft carrier. Um, they also had a, a distinct anti-urban position for the ones that were built in cities. So you see that this one straddles a, a former street and closed a street, disconnecting its community and having a very different sort of urban relationship to its, its context. So I'm going to go through uh, an example of each one of them. This is a uh, built school called the School Without Walls Senior High School. Uh, the building on the right was built in 1882 and uh, was expanded just a few years ago, a 30,000 square foot original building with about a 30,000 square foot addition. It is in a very tight urban fabric in downtown Washington, D.C., embedded in George Washington University uh, in many ways. And so while the building was literally falling apart and uh, down and around the students, uh, plaster falling out the ceilings. You know, one math teacher told me it snowed in his classroom. There were great opportunities in this building, you know, both to connect to the university and avail uh, the school's resources of things like the union, the auditorium, the library that was available from the university, so that things that didn't have to be built on that site. And while the building was falling apart, we had to, in many ways, convince people that it was a, a great building, it had great DNA, it had natural light on all sides, as, as you can see uh, you know, in the diagram in the upper right. It also had a center hall that, that was being used in part because of the lack of space, but, but also just because it was the culture of this sort of collegiate level school here to have breakout groups that you see or, or share lunch in that center hall. So when the modernization addition was put forward, you know, the idea was that we could address everything from accessibility that you see uh, the stair on the right would have made the existing building quite challenging to arrive at. So instead, there is a ramp coming up here to the front door. But we're also creating an educational place while we're addressing accessibility. So we're getting the most value for our, our investment. And the natural light that was so great about that historic building was complemented by the addition um, on this tight urban site by bringing it in from above through skylights. And one of the big takeaways from today's uh, discussion, I think, is that it wasn't incumbent on the 19th century building to do everything that was required of that 21st century program. Uh, we allowed the largest spaces, like the commons here in the back, 
and the smallest spaces like elevators and bathrooms and administrative spaces and art rooms and media centers to be handled by the addition. You know, so the two working in contrast became one great complementary composition or campus. But in the existing buildings, we worked hard to keep the infrastructure from not frustrating the, the great things about the historic architecture, dropping the ceilings, hitting the heads of the windows. So we took advantage of existing chases and ran uh, all the systems vertically uh, through each of the quadrants. But this is a Lee Gold building, so a lot of the finishes that you see are recreations. The exterior wall was recreated. Uh, acoustics were handled through uh, storm windows so that we could keep the existing wood windows. But we also then created uh, extended learning environments, you know, again in those center halls and in the new building and complementary sort of spaces that where you see these all the children here breaking out and collaborating in small groups. And even on a small site like this half acre, uh, we created a roof terrace, you know, to create the first outdoor space that the school ever had. So on a half acre site, you can have great outdoor space. Um, and you can also in an existing building have great places for teachers to collaborate where each floor is available for them. And then finally, you can celebrate you know, the existing architecture and the heritage of the school as here in this idea of the school without walls overlooking the university and its existing school celebrating its history. That second generation, pre-war building here, Stoddard Elementary School, an original building that you see on the left of 17,000 square feet with an addition of 48,000 square feet, was a place that was dramatically under provisioned with space so that really all was a collection of classrooms and you see a pre-k room uh, or a kindergarten room in the lower right that was being used for the cafeteria modulars behind it a small site of six and a half acres uh, very heavily used by the community but when we started the job we realized that they had only built this piece from the 1932 master plan by the original architect but there was a bigger idea of expanding the uh, campus, creating another building just like it in Mirror Image, but also creating a building in the center that was multi-purpose room administration off of a great entry courtyard. So the new building responded to that idea back from 32, thinking that that you know, urbanism and uh, is appropriate for our urban schools um, and created that central courtyard that was always imagined, putting the front door back where it was supposed to be, uh, back here in, in the campus, and uh, also creating that great place for the community, parents, teachers, kids all to come together. Continuing inside, cr bringing that public space into the building, creating a, an extended learning environment that's the heart of the school in many ways but it also is right adjacent to the front door. Uh, one of the major flaws with many of the old buildings is that the administration um, is, is tucked away and hard to find. So here they are greeting everybody and welcoming them through transparency and, and being present right at the front, making sure that appropriate behavior is happening in and around the building. And you can see here, uh, you know, some of the children just taking advantage of that space and the transparency behind uh, with the front office being present. This is a joint use facility, so everything on the right of the, the circle is available after hours uh, for parks and recreation to program, and everything on the left can be turned off. Uh, so after hours, uh, the classroom neighborhoods are, are don't need to be recleaned after a community event. And some of the uh, facilities that are available include uh, an adult sized gym, even though this is an uh, elementary school, this is a middle school sized gym to, to accommodate the community use. And you know, an openness and transparency again, suggesting you know that this is a great community asset and resource. Multi-purpose rooms for art and science and community groups to meet in. There's a green roof in the back. Uh, media center, um, extensions of the interior space. You know, from the formal learning environments to informal learning environments, using you know about 20 or 30 percent of our buildings is circulation. So if we can capture some of that into educational activity we continue to create value out of our educational environments. One of the new classrooms, again, uh, everything from acoustics to lighting to views to color to display, all featured here. But likewise, in the 1932 classrooms, modernized to be the equal of everything in those new classrooms, but the proportions are a little different. One thing to recognize is that you know there, there are constraints in both new buildings and the existing buildings that force us to, to be creative sometimes. Here's that extension of the learning environment space again, just with some of the use, which spills straight outside, connecting inside and out. Um, and these children just threw the football through the louvers there. Um, this is also a lead gold building. 
um, as well. But again, all opportunities becoming great educational spaces, spaces for the community to come together. In terms of modern infrastructure, this is one of the first geothermal systems uh, for this particular district to apply to an existing building or an expanded building, uh, very successfully implemented outdoor spaces um, as good on this tight site as any other site that's more expansive but you can't waste any square foot because uh, the space is so valuable on, on these small sites. And then a building of the post-war generation, Langley High School, a building built in 1966 presenting a lot of those challenges of this generation, the floor to floor heights 10 foot 6, you can see it in the ceiling heights down here, so very demanding on our infrastructure uh, to create spaces that are pleasant to be in or adequately lit uh, in many ways. I've also, as I've noted, had not on this building but on other buildings of this generation detailing issues with some of the experimental exterior wall conditions but nothing that can't be overcome um, but this building didn't have much of a presence as you can see in the lower left but very tight site 43 acres again that's about 10 acres less than the CFPI guidelines would have called for uh, traffic conflicts you know, between buses, cars, people you know, out front you know, as we approach a site. Uh, the existing building also had a lot of issues of not being able to find a front office, which was back here buried in the building, and other access issues and program deficiencies. And even when you look at a simple building like this, a simple courtyard building, you start to realize that even the original architecture had some strange things going on here that you would think this circulation path would have completed the circuit, but it didn't. So our solution was in many ways to open the building up, uh, create a connection you know, called the heart of the school that can, you know, create a flow across the campus you know, from all these major program elements, but also you know, create that continuous loop around. So creating a wayfinding opportunity in the courtyard, uh, an outdoor educational opportunity, and then a circulation opportunity. So here's the original plan on the left and the final plan on the right. One thing to note in the original plan, um, which is not that it's entirely original, there are additions from 1988 here. In some instances, when you're looking at an existing building, you might have to resolve some things that have done, been done in the past that were inappropriate. So many of these additions are coming off when you assess them in the new plan. And then there's a new addition, particularly focused on the STEM program uh, within the building back here to accommodate that short ceiling height and allow the addition again to do the things that the existing building can't, but you know, complementing that sort of circular circulation system and the idea of courtyards uh, within each. We also resolved the traffic circulation and created an, a, a sort of second front door, enhancing the ability to find the front office, enter the building appropriately. This is uh, for that final fourth category, the energy crisis buildings, uh, Glenville Elementary School. And take a hard look at this photograph. Uh, you, know, you can see you know, a building that has a, a quite pleasant uh, arrival and gracious uh, presence. Uh, I would hope, and that when you realize that this is what it looked like originally, you can see that the great distance that this building has traveled, and many of these generation, uh, the buildings of these generations require, you know, perhaps a, a more aggressive approach to to bring them into a state of uh, contemporary uh, affairs. But here, you know, a building that you know was not entirely windowless, but you know certainly looked more like a self-storage facility than. Uh, a school and also on the, in the plan on the left you can see the challenge of these sort of wide body buildings and bringing natural light in um, but fortunately a one-story building in this instance allowed us to start to carve courtyards into the building and, and erode its exterior and, and add a few modest additions to create something that is open and airy and engages the landscape and here you see one of the courtyards and in contrast to the two photos on the, the right, uh, an interior that has great public spaces, you know, again, flooded with natural light and connectivity to those courtyards. And again, you know, with the before images on the left uh, for the educational environments, dark and no lack of views, uh, opening up, you know, on the right, you know, to the courtyards or to the exterior uh, through the, the very significant intervention done on this building. And finally, 
I'd like to share with you a, an adaptive reuse project, which we're seeing more and more of, particularly in, in our major urban centers. This one happens to be in Manhattan. And these share something in common with, with the, the previous project, is that many of these industrial buildings are those wide body buildings. This one happens to be 10 stories tall, however, um, and accommodates a, a K-12 population in an independent school. And so you start to think about all the opportunities that that extra space gives you in these wider buildings that the narrower floor plates, the 70 foot wide buildings, you know, can't necessarily accommodate spaces like you see here that have program on the exterior wall uh, in the background, teaching formal teaching space on the left and then exterior breakout space and sort of a neighborhood quality uh, on the right here. Uh, so allowing uh, you know, a different relationship of spaces in, in some of these larger buildings and even opportunities to connect you know, out to the landscape on these very, very urban sites. That's the high line in the background there, but the opportunity to open up you know, the exterior wall, much like the School Without Walls did, and create uh, you know, even good outdoor learning spaces on the smallest of sites. And thinking about adaptive reuse as well, though, what these buildings, of course, didn't do. This was a building built in 1928, uh, designed by Cass Gilbert, the architect of uh, the Supreme Court and the Woolworth Building. But he never imagined a gym in there. It was a warehouse. So raising the roof in many ways, uh, you know, metaphorically and literally, uh, allows us to create those kinds of program spaces and, and uh, carefully stack the building to make sure that uh, all the program can be accommodated in there. Having looked at some of those case studies, one of the challenges you often hear too is is that these are occupied schools and uh, there there's a certain degree of challenge in, in doing that and there are many methodologies and approaches that you can use uh, to do that from swing space you know to putting modulars on the site or you know phasing the implementation which these series of diagrams are about. One of the uh, takeaways again in a phased approach like this is that the first phase that you see here was designed to be as big as possible and, and remove as little as possible of, of the existing program space so that it could be used as a swing space for subsequent spaces you know, to be enabled. Uh, phases to be enabled, as you can see in the middle column or the rightmost column. And even on these historic buildings, we did take the uh, multi-purpose room off uh, the back of the building here to expand you know, the, the academic community, the academic neighborhoods uh, within there. So again, it's uh, an approach that respects the existing architecture, but does perhaps modify it uh, in, in ways that might be surprising to some. And a few other points about our existing inventory as well. One of the things that we've done a lot of uh, with some of our clients, particularly charter schools, but also public schools, is, is to incrementally modernize schools. And this goes both to the phasing idea, but also to budgetary resources that what you see here is a modernized learning environment where we created a you know, contemporary classroom, moved some partitions you know, back and forth, new lighting, new HVAC, new finishes, new furniture. But if you look at the windows, you'll realize that those are the original 1972 windows there. All this work that you see was done over a summer while the school was out, so not impacting their program at all. The subsequent summer, uh, the team came back and replaced the windows. And the subsequent summer, you can do the, you know, the next process of modernizing perhaps the central plant. This allows you know finances to flow more evenly. Also it impacts the educational program less. Uh, it does cost a little more due to general conditions. For example is, is making sure that or, or looking at their sustainable design system to acknowledge the fact that this is a necessity uh, in many districts, you know, to do this kind of incremental change. And so reinforcing the idea that these can be sustainable schools, uh, you know, all through this sort of uh, phased process. One or two final points. And this is a charter school that we did uh, several years ago in a building that was an assemblage of buildings from 1936, you know, into the 50s, 60s, and even had an addition in the 70s, which is characteristic of many buildings. But that it had fundamentally great DNA and that if we respected that DNA and uh, you see one of the classrooms in the lower left with hardwood floors and, and took advantage of that. Um, we didn't actually have to change too much for this program and we ended up with a building that probably cost half of what uh, you know, some were spending on both modernizations and you know, certainly new construction at that period of time. The school has celebrated its success you know, ever since moving in. So finally, to 
propose a different way of looking at value and how we value these existing buildings. The top two tend to be how uh, we typically do it, I think. You know, one is that, you know, the cost of our investment and the resulting educational advocacy. But what I'm hoping is that, you know, through this conversation, we've suggested that certainly operational cost on the site, but also transportation costs are, are a factor. The cultural heritage, uh, you know, and the value of, you know, some of these buildings, uh, you know, both in terms of their neighborhood connectivity and, and their presence you know, within the community is, needs to be considered. Environmental impact, both on site and off, again, thinking about, you know, those emissions, you know, associated with those more remote sites that are alternatives to some of our existing facilities. And then the idea that these are uh, centers of community and that we need to somehow account for that uh, aspect as well. So in summary, what I'd like to leave you with uh, as a few takeaways is that you know, all school buildings, regardless of age, are subject to constant change. That analysis that uh, Tom Roger did affects buildings that just opened, and I've had buildings that you know, open up, and before you know it, you've got staff that were never considered in the ed spec uh, in the buildings. And technology certainly obsolesces our buildings faster than we can simply modify them. So we have to consider that you know new is only a temporary solution you know in many instances existing and historic schools can foster 21st century education there's very advanced pedagogies uh, you know in some of those schools that I showed you ranging from joint use and early education early college education programs at schools at walls you can save money modernizing schools um, that may not always be the case but it, it's certainly uh, an opportunity they can be more sustainable when you think about all scales Additions are often the key to unlocking the potential of the existing building. And that idea of incremental and phased approaches is uh, eminently possible on many of our buildings, uh, bringing them in, you know, progressively into a state of, of good repair and uh, progressive education. And then finally, that, that value proposition is, is more than you know, the simple equation that it includes life cycle education, heritage, sustainability, and community. So with that, thank you. I think we have some time to take some questions now. I'm going to read through some of the questions coming in here. What is the largest hurdle you've faced in convincing school leaders and community members that newer is not always better? And how did you suggest to effectively achieve renovation in this situation? There are all challenges in many ways. I think one, as I suggested, is that quite often a perception is that the building, you know, people have been living with, you know, a building in, in deferred maintenance, like the School Without Walls. There's a wonderful video that the students put together that if people are interested, I could provide a, a link to um, that showed, you know, a facility that, you know, was falling down, windows falling out, um, you know, ad hoc renovations, you know, all the while. So I think the challenge is, you know, to have the ability to look past that and, you know, and perceive that the great qualities of a facility that might be in tremendous disrepair and might, you know, be, have considerable life safety issues. So in that instance, that, that student created video was one of the most convincing things that I've ever seen. Um, and they did that on our own. And you, know, you have those moments where you realize you know, how great the school is that you're working with uh, you know, through those kinds of instances. But I think the other hurdle is that you need to have people engaged in the process that truly believe that they're going to explore all the options. Uh, one of my challenges, which I didn't dwell on, was that there's a preconceived notion that many approach the problem with. And that preconception you know, predetermines what the conclusion is. Um, so I think you need to have the, the right people working on the project that you know truly are open-minded. And, and maybe the new building is the right solution, but that you need to give the existing building a fair shake. The second question is, how do you address concerns of stakeholders that say infrastructure, mechanical plumbing, security, technology, et cetera, can never really be updated unless you build new? Um, well, I, I think as you saw through some of these uh, case studies, I hope, that uh, you know, we have a 19th century building that has the educational technology that is derived directly from the university's educational technology standards so that 
when a professor in a joint use situation, which they have there, can walk into that building after hours, plug into the university or into the school system and connect straight into the university and, and have the resources that are uh, available to, to any faculty member anywhere on that campus. I think that it's certainly possible any one of those buildings has contemporary uh, systems that are comparable to any new building. Sometimes you uh, actually end up with systems like ground source heat pumps uh, at, at Langley because the ceiling heights are so low and we can end up with a system that may be more uh, energy efficient You know, if, if you're clever about how it's handled. But the other way to do it is is look for these examples, um, tour these examples. There, there are hundreds of buildings you know, that have been successfully done across the district, but also the clearinghouses is holding this discussion in part you know, to provide you the resources to know where those precedents are and examples uh, you know, that you can hold up and, and discuss as part of the design process. Question three is when the schools and the case studies were contemplating renovation, what sources of funding did they pursue? It's a, a question that's a little above my pay grade, but um, there's a host of different things that happened that I'm aware of uh, on them. One for the School Without Walls, the 19th century building, there was a public-private partnership that was done with the university where the project only happened because of selling a portion of the parking lot that was available to that school to the university and then also transferring air rights uh, for, that we didn't need on the school site over to the university so that they could build a new residence hall that they sorely needed both the air rights and, and that land for. And that transaction brought about $13 million uh, into that project, which moved it uh, fundamentally from the last in line to the first in line on, on the modernization list, just because the, the district didn't have the money to, to do that project any time in the near future. So there are very clever solutions like that um, that we're seeing um, in some jurisdictions. And it takes uh, you know, a partnership much broader than you know, the, the conventional other ones include, you know, some of the charter schools, you know, get a certain percentage of their funding from the district, but then they leverage that in the financial marketplace to implement some of their projects um, that you saw in here as well. Others were, you know, conventionally funded through bond issues, you know, for, for each project. But, you know, sometimes when you're presented with a, a challenge, like at the School Without Walls, it was, in fact, the parent and the school community that uh, created that uh, real estate transaction with the university built on the relationship that they had programmatically. So um, sometimes you have to innovate, you know, to, to create these projects. So I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, it doesn't appear that there are any further questions here. And there is the opportunity to take advantage of Twitter. And then I will uh, turn it back to the clearinghouse uh, at this time. Thank you. ASEP would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter and our participants for joining our webinar today. We hope that you took this opportunity to learn from the content presented, engage with the speaker, and we'll use this content to advance your knowledge on educational facilities. Take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback. Remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please call if the ASF staff can assist you in any way. Have a great day. Thank you.